We watch something. Uh, I'll, I'll commend it to you, and I have to tell you, I don't know. Um, I'm probably going to get in trouble because I don't know who puts it out. Uh, but there's co- something out there called John 1010. It's called the John 1010 Project. And uh, so far, what they presented is, uh, I think, really good. What they do is a lot of cinematography to capture a lot of times nature in space and explain the nature of who God is and what he does in the world. And uh, we sometimes watch that as a part of our Bible time to, to see what God's doing in the world and to see evidences of God's hand. And this last one we watched was about spring. And so if I was to ask you, what is your favorite time of year? What would your favorite time of year be? Well, uh, some, some uh, you know, would even say winter. Something's wrong there. Um, <laughs> some people say, well, I really love snow. <laughs> okay, there are those people, I guess. Um, matter of fact, in Pinedale, Wyoming, I was talking to Pastor Ted York this morning. Uh, it's snowing in their service right now. Uh, uh, well, not in their service, but out there. Yeah, so. They've got like, they've, they've had already three inches and it's still snowing as they are welcoming spring in Wyoming. So praise the Lord for Idaho. <laughs> anyway, um, but you know, spring for our family, we got done watching the, the video about spring and it was talking about the flowers and God's uh, creation. Our family chimed in that spring was their favorite time of season. I know that it's my wife's favorite time of season. Uh, the, I think it's, it brings to us hope the encouragement of our expectation, right? You, uh, the expectation, what is, what is it that we're really expecting with, with spring? Well, we're expecting that snow will stop and that cold weather will stop. And, uh, you know, while I love the flowers that come up in spring, there are also weeds that come right there with them, right? So uh, I, I'm already behind, already behind the curveball, but trying to catch up on that. And, and, and I think the expectation that spring is is just that. And it's, it's true that each season has its blessing, but it is also true that in, a, in the winter months, it, it is really symbolic of, of lack of life for all the trees that lose their leaves and, and remain there stark through the winter. Uh, we understand that that really doesn't have the allure that, that uh, spring does with the leaves coming on the tree, so much so that in Christmas time, we put lights on those trees to make them look pretty again. But uh, as we think about the hope that spring is, you know, for me, that really starts with Groundhog's Day. And and uh, if you're new to Idaho, I, and I won't make you raise your hand because people are maybe not wanting to say you've just barely been here, but one of the things that we look for here is akin to the groundhog. What is it? What is that thing I'm, I'm talking Some of you are saying, what is it? It's a rock chuck. The first time you say that somebody that's not from Idaho, they're they look at you sideways. What do you mean, rock chuck? What are you talking about? Well, it's basically like a groundhog. I look for them every spring. They come out in February, and they hibernate. They go to hibernation around July, August. Uh, and they, so they hibernate, hibernate about six months of the year. But I look to that because it begins to give that hope that spring's coming. It's getting there. It's getting there. As Christians, we have hope that is much more enduring than what the weather might be today or tomorrow. And uh, God's given us a beautiful day for Easter Sunday, right? Yeah, praise the Lord for that. And by the way, I want to encourage you, if you, haven't, if you want to be in the directory and, and uh, haven't been or don't know about it, or they're taking pictures for that today, um, it's a beautiful day to, to celebrate the Lord and to celebrate His goodness. And, and we're turning to hear 1 Peter chapter 1, and we read about the hope that we have as Christians. The hope is in the gospel and what Christ has done on the cross. We look at verse 3, and I'm going to ask us to read out loud. If you don't have your Bible with you, that's fine. People next to you will be reading, I, I hope. If you've got your Bible app or your Bible there, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, would you read that out loud with me? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. (laughs) And all God's people said, this passage starts with blessed be God, and the blessed be God is our way of saying, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy 
and he's talking to believers here in 1 Peter. According to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again. It says lively hope in our King James, and it means a living hope. We have a hope that is alive. I think it's important to know that hope in the Bible is not the hope that we speak of in our English language where there is something that might happen that you're looking forward to. The idea of a kid wanting something at Christmas that might or might not be under the tree. Or as I heard in Sunday school, somebody wanting to get a car. Uh, The hope that you might have or might not have that might be realized. That's not the case of the hope in the Bible. Hope in the Bible is a certain, a confident looking forward to what God has promised. And here it says that we've been born again or begotten again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And because of Christ's resurrection, we have hope for what our future has in store. We have hope because of what God has promised. Now, it's interesting as you study about Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, when it is celebrated, and it's actually got a a month window, and if you go back and do research on it, there's debate on exactly when it should be celebrated. We know from the Bible that we have those that celebrate one day over another and some um, that don't. We, as Christians, recognize that we come together to worship God and have a church to come to to worship God because of what Christ did on the cross. In other words, if it wasn't for Christ, we wouldn't have a church at all. We wouldn't be gathered here. So every time we come together as God's people, we are really reflecting what Christ did for us on the cross and bringing us into the family of God. And we want to then come together to worship him. That's why this passage, I think, starts with the idea of blessed be God. But he's given us new birth and a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say there's more in store for us in that hope than just being rescued from hell. It says it in this way in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So God tells you that he's got something in store for you beyond this life and that is more, again, than just rescue from hell. He's got an inheritance for you. If you do a Bible study on heaven, which we're not going to do this morning, we'll talk about it, but heaven is so much greater than anything that we are living for here. So we have a hope because of the gospel, because of Christ. It ends in verse 5 where it says we are kept, those who know Christ, are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And here's the idea. When someone comes to know Christ as their Savior, he secures their soul in heaven and they are kept by the power of God. Now, salvation is something that you lay hold of when you leave this world behind. But for the believer, God promises that you get everlasting life upon the moment of trusting Christ as your Savior. A verse that most people know here is John 3.16. You know that verse? Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 1 John 5.11-13. I'm not going to read that passage, but verse 12 in the middle of that says this. He that hath the Son hath life. And he doesn't say is going to get life, but they have life right now. And that life is resurrection life, eternal life, the living hope life that comes through the resurrected Christ. So we have hope because of Christ. Now, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm not supposed to necessarily focus on our, myself here when I'm preaching to you. But how did your night go last night? How did your night go? I can tell sometimes how your night went by how you're doing right now. <clears throat> um, for whatever, you ever have those nights where you cannot sleep? So uh, it was like that for me last night. Now, I, 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 some of you don't know my story, but I, I was in a car accident some time ago, and so I've got a pretty highfalutin bed, which vibrates, raises the front end, raises the lower end. It's got, it's got um, Bluetooth capability. I can charge my phone. It does everything but heat my coffee, which I'm blessed that my kids do for me every, every morning pretty much. Uh, but I told my wife when I got up this morning, I put that bed through its, through its uh, paces last night in every position, trying to find a way to go to sleep and uh, a whole lot of stories behind that. But I, what, I'm, what I'm reminded about is this, and there's a lot of people that deal with things one way or another. 
And, and it has to do with pain and suffering, right? It, and, and there is pain and suffering in the world. And our world experiences that and knows that and feels that. But there's a rescue. And that rescue is Jesus. So we're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We've got a lot of passages to read this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have hope because of our resurrected Savior. And because of our resurrected Savior, we know that this life is not all there is. And I want to be careful as we move forward. Everybody look outside that window right now. Look out there. Does that look like a good day? I mean, especially if you think about Pinedale getting snowed on. You look out there, it has all the hope that spring is. Matter of fact, you've seen the trees that are, that, are, uh, that are getting the flowers on them now, right? It's just a beautiful time of year. It, 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 it speaks of the life that is coming in the spring. Our lives are like that, that we have a hope that we're going to have a resurrected life because of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in the Bible, a little something for you to tuck away. We're not turning there. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is known as the resurrection chapter. <coughs> so we're in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. The gospel is how people get saved. If there was no gospel, people would not have a way of salvation. We're going to see about that gospel here in just a moment. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, Unless you have believed in vain. Believing in vain has the idea of not really meaning it. Not really following Christ. It may be even giving lip service. Maybe even give the head knowledge. And by the way, through the history of this church, there have been plenty who, who said that, that they knew Jesus and, and today are not walking with him. And they would be those that the Bible says that many in the last day will say to me, Lord, Lord. And yet he says, I never knew you. So the hope of the gospel is for anybody who truly believes. Well, verse 3, I, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that, what did Christ do? Read it out loud. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Why did Christ die? Why did Christ die? It's right there. Why did he die? For our sins. He died to make reconciliation for us. He died to cover all the sin debt that you and I have against Christ. All the things that would keep us out of heaven. Christ died for all of that. Every last sin that you have ever done. And by the way, while we still breathe, every last sin that we will commit here in this vapor of a life. Christ died for our sins. Now how important is the gospel? It's important enough to know that God's plan of the gospel was in place before he ever made the world. But he made the world, and people want to argue with God, well, why would God make a world that could sin, and why would God do this? And I'm just going to tell you that many times those questions are a reflection of our sin nature. That instead of seeing God's good hand, John 3, 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Instead of seeing God's good hand, they say, well, if I was God, I would have never done that. But there's a way of salvation that God has made and God has declared. It's called the gospel. And Christ died for your sins so that you might have the opportunity to be saved. And I know that in the heart of man arises all these questions and accusations against God. But it's important enough that God not only ordained before the world began the nature of the gospel, the path of the gospel, but Christ put on human flesh, according to Philippians chapter 2, and went to the cross and suffered and died for you and for me because you and the gospel plan were that important to him. And he dies not for his own sin, but he dies for you. And he dies for you, not just so that you can be a flower plucked from the field and put it in the vase of heaven. But instead, as a living, eternal being, he rescues you from hell and gives you life where you will have a new body forever with the Lord redeemed. Now, he says, he died according to our sins, according to the scriptures, verse 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, again, according to the scriptures. So, we are celebrating 
Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, because there is a Savior. Because Christ did rise from the dead. Now, again, people would argue, well, how do you know it's true? You know, the Bible is just a conglomeration of people's thoughts. Well, that's a deeper study. But I will tell you that you have Paul's reiteration of the witnesses that prove that Christ was risen from the dead. And I think, I think it's very interesting. And again, it just gives the window into heart, the heart of man that is, again, sin-stained, wicked, and willing to rebel against God, where we'll believe that there was uh, George Washington, we'll believe that there was uh, an Adolf Hitler, we'll believe that there was a Pontius Pilate, or we'll believe these other figures in history, but we'll decide not to believe Jesus. Well, listen to the witnesses. Listen to the witnesses in verse 5. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under the present. In other words, their testimony could be verified. But some are falling asleep. The Bible's language there in the King James means that they died or have died. <clears throat> Verse 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet or worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, will God's gospel reach anyone no matter what your sin is? Yes, because he says the nature of his sin he said he persecuted the church of God, verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And let me just say in that statement, folks, nobody here who knows Jesus and is saved is worthy of it. It is all God's grace. So if you think about religious people thinking that they're better than you, if somebody has that view, they don't understand the nature of their sin nature. Every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us needs God's grace. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we do what? We preach, and so ye believed. Well, that's actually a decision. So what we're doing right here, believe it or not, this is preaching. Some do it with more fire, some do it with less fire. But this is the declaring of the message of the gospel. But it's up to you what you do with it. It's up to you what you do with the message. Verse 12. <clears throat> now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say, same, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection, let's play that game. If there be no resurrection of the dead, well, then Christ is not risen. Well, you've got a problem with that because he just laid out the witnesses that he was risen. But if Christ be not risen, if we're going to go down that path, then is our preaching in vain? Our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and ye are what? Yet in your sins. Then they also which fall asleep or have died in Christ are perished. Verse 19, everybody read that out loud if you would. Verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Why? Because you would be living a lie, living under religious structure when there is no Savior. And you have a conjunction in verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead? Again, witness testified by those who are even living at Paul's time that could be asked of their own testimony and witness. He says, And become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, this is talking about Adam and the original sin, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And the all be made alive is whosoever will. If you want to be saved, the only thing preventing you from being saved is your heart's disposition in turning to faith in Christ or not. But it's your call. It's your decision. 1 Corinthians 15, further down, verse 50, we read this. In the hope that we have before us, in the hope that Christians have. Now, before I go there, the longer you live, the more you're going to know that this life is not all there is. And the more you're going to experience the frailty of your life and the groaning of your flesh. It's the nature of all things. Uh, I've often said this because uh, it was my first 
senior witness to uh, being a senior. And I've often given his name. His name's Benton Bell. He was a fiery uh, three-piece suit, five foot three, uh, uh, 90, I think three-year-old at the time. And whenever I shook his hand, he would, he would shake my hand like he was, you know, 18 and, and working out. And he would shake my hand and I'd say, Brother Benton, how's it going? And he said, every day is like wrestling an alligator to get out of bed. <laughs> and as a young man, I'm like, oh, you okay, brother? Yeah, well, I don't even know what that means, but okay. You live long enough, you'll know it. <laughs> as we've often said, growing old ain't for sissies. But growing old is the telltale of time, the telltale of clock, the telltale that there is going to be a time where you're going to breathe your last breath and you're going to stand accountable before God with what you did with Jesus. So the gospel is preached. Some of us may make the end of our clock. I, I, you know, you sometimes have those days where you don't feel like you're going to endure very long. I was sucking my thumb this last week. I told Nora, I said, I don't think I'm going to be very enduring. I look at, I look at some of our seniors and I think, I don't think that I'm going to do that. I don't think I'm going to go that long. But you remember when you were 18 and you didn't think you'd live to be 30? Because 30 is old. Right? Young people are going, yeah. Old people are going, oh. I, to speak of longevity, <coughs> there's a lot of celebration of anniversaries happened this, you know, last year. Um, my wife and I celebrated 30 and we're like, hey, you know, 30 years. Howard and Sharon, how many years? Do you know? Put you on the spot there, didn't I? Yeah, 68. So when I say married 30 years and I hear them say 68, I, I, I kind of think them in my mind's I hear them saying, kid. <laughs> <laughs> right? Kid, you got a ways to go yet. But the truth is, the older we, the older we go, the longer we go, the more we know that this body was not meant to live forever on this planet. And not only do you know that it was not meant to live forever, you begin to find those things in your body that are breaking down and breaking down and breaking down. And, and you look at what our people are dealing with. And Don Rhodes is uh, dealing with um, very significant issues. And I know that some people were by to visit him this week, and he really couldn't even visit for the pain that he was in. Don is ready to go to glory because he knows Jesus. And if he could be here in this room, he would tell you, my hope is Jesus, the anchor of my soul. My hope is Jesus. This is the nature of the gospel. Verse 50 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, hear this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery the mystery that's been revealed, that's why he's showing it to you. Something that was not known, now you can know. We shall not all sleep or be dead or in the grave, but we shall all be changed. Read it out loud with me, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. How are, how are those who are in Christ going to be raised incorruptible? And we like to play with this. We like, to, we like to think about what this is going to be to be raised incorruptible. We're going to be changed. We're going to be called up to glory in the twinkling of an eye. The twinkling of an eye is not the blink of an eye. It's the amount of time it takes for a flash of light to go across your eye, which is faster than a blink, okay? But that's how quickly we're going to be changed. And we often think, okay, what's that going to look like when we're caught up to the Lord? What's going to be left behind? I know that I'm going to have some bolts and screws left behind. But so are you, because you probably got a screw loose too. All right, so there you go. <laughs> Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall, be, shall have put on incorruption, verse 54, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And all God's people said, Amen. O death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? I, I, I'm, I'm likened to these guys that are going to go into some kind of a, an ultimate fight or a boxing thing, and they've got a lot of bravado ahead of time. They're going to say everything they're going to do to that guy when they get in the ring, and then they show later when that guy's in the ring and that guy's knocked out laying on the ground. All that bravado is gone. That's the grave. 
For all those who know Christ, that bravado of the grave is gone because we have a resurrected Savior. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. Let's read verse 57 and 58 out loud. Verse 57 and 58 out loud. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And why is it not in vain? Because there really is a God. There really is a Savior. There really is an eternity. And you're going to stand before Him. And those who are giving your life to Christ and serving Christ with your life, God remembers it all. Our hope, our faith, is not in vain. All that is the introduction to today's message <laughs> in Matthew chapter 16. The backdrop of our message this morning is the hope that we have in Christ, our resurrected Savior. Now, by the way, those who are visiting and say that's his introduction, don't be nervous. I know I got next Sunday, so, uh, well, I think I've got next Sunday. And if I don't, Pastor Phil's got next Sunday. Here's the notes, brother. <laughs> Change them, right? Matthew chapter 16. All right, so what have I just given as a backdrop? I've given as a backdrop the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel, because of resurrected Christ, we have hope. And hope that is a living hope, an encouraging hope. So, men, it's not, it's not being feminine to like flowers, okay? So you can, you can like flowers in this moment. But when you see flowers blooming in the spring, it's a beautiful thing. Matter of fact, in the video I told you about, they, they show landscapes of flowers in the mountains that are a sea of flowers. And you look at that and it's, it's just stunning. By the way, that's how our mountains are. If you go up into the mountains right now, first of all, wear some kind of tick repellent. But if you go up there, you're going to see fields and fields and fields of just mountains covered in flowers. All that is, I think, a testimony of God taking things that are seeds in the ground and showing that to you the new life that they're given in the body that they're given in a flower. And you and I are going to get a new body in Christ. So I think it's just a picture of the resurrection. But in Matthew chapter 16, as we think about the hope and the gospel that we have, there's a backdrop here of the Pharisees. I'm going to read for you Matthew 16, 1 through 4. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered, said unto them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but, cannot, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Now it's important to know, that as we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 16, if you're just to look back in chapter 15, in verses 29 through 31, you have in Jesus' public, public ministry in Matthew 15, 29 through 31, where he healed many. So let me ask you, is healing a miracle? Pretty obviously, it is, right? And these were miracles, not like the TV miracles you see today, which often are just a sham. These are miracles where the blind are made to see, the lame are made to walk, and where Christ... Uh, even as you're going to see in a testament of his work, um, many would say the pinnacle, pinnacle of, of his power and miracle was to raise Lazarus from the dead, proving his authority, his power over life and death. Now, why is Jesus God? Well, he's God because of who he is, but also proves who he is because of what he's done. Nobody else has the power to raise the dead to give life and to take it away and to raise it again, except for God. So he proves who he is. But he says, a wicked generation seeks after a sign, and he's already given them a sign in Matthew 15, verse 29 through 31. 
But also in verses 32 through 39, he had fed 4,000 people with fish and bread. That were uh, just a few and then breaks them and feeds thousands. In other words, made food out of nothing, out of these fragments, and he makes enough to feed thousands. So was his or were his miraculous signs witnessed by the Pharisees and Sadducees? Well, that's not a trick question. They knew what he had done. Some commentaries say, especially because what is said in verse one or verses one through four of chapter 16 follows these miracles of Matthew 15, that really what they wanted him to do was just to feed everybody again and to have the, the temporary benefit of a meal. Regardless, uh, in verse 5 of Matthew 16, we pick up again. His disciples were come to the other side. They had forgotten to take bread. Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, it's going to bear out what he means here. But in verse 7, And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets ye took up? And what's he asking? What's he asking? Do you not remember the miracle? Did you have proof? Is there sufficient evidence to prove to you who I am and what I've done? Do you not remember? How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then, verse 12, they understood... Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the what? Doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So here's where we are this morning. The majority of this planet does not believe in Christ. The majority of this planet either denies him, denies God altogether, Atheists, or says you cannot know there's a God, agnostics, or worship some other God of their own making called idolatry. While there has been historic and testimonial proof and witnesses of the works of Jesus, and Jesus says, in particular, I think in our application this morning of what we see, Beware of the false doctrine of the religious people around you. And by the way, I'm going to give a broad net to that religion. Atheism is a religion. It's a faith and a hope. Even I I just listened to some debates of atheists denying Christ and not wanting to use the word faith. And they were using the word confidence. Confidence. And confidence comes from the word confide, which is Latin, to have faith. But they have faith in what they're believing, and they want to dissuade you from your belief. They want you to follow them and deny Jesus. And the whole world around you is going to make that an expression of their belief. And Christ says the same thing to you in this passage that he would say to his disciples, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Beware of what you believe. Beware of the influences that come into your life and say, oh, I know all these people that don't believe in Jesus and I was raised around that, but you know, I don't need to believe that because so many people don't. It's just a bunch of made up stories. You know, the truth is God has given all the evidence you need and will hold you accountable to the evidence that he's given so that you have to step over what you know to be true of God to believe something else. And that accountability will be in the day of judgment. So the gospel is given not to condemn you, but to save you. Verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now remember, this is Matthew 16. 
where we've already seen the miracles, already seen the works of Christ. And they're saying, who do, who do people, he's saying, who do people say that I am? Verse 14. They said, some that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias and other Jeremiah or one of the prophets. They recognize something's miraculous about Jesus. But now he zeroes in on them. And this is what I want to do for you. Here we are. You, me, if we're at a coffee table, this is what we'd be asking. But whom say ye that Jesus is? And that's the question of the destiny of your soul. Whether you're going to have the hope of the gospel or the terror of judgment. It's your answer about Jesus. Simon Peter in verse 16 is answered and says, Pastor Phil read this, Thou art the Christ. The Christ, the word Christ meant the Messiah. It means the one that was to come, that was prophesied. It's not just his name, but it's his title. It's the prophetic one who fulfilled the coming of the Savior. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answers Simon Peter and says unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon. Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, a moment here, folks. I think in this is at least a minor allusion to the fact that you need not have confidence in the words of men. Men and women will lead you astray based on their own dispositions and their own desires. The only reason anyone is saved is because of the mercy of God that gives us eyes to see. I just want to remind you that we didn't go looking for Christ who were saved without uh, any compunction of the Lord. The Lord through his spirit is in the world drawing people to saving faith. And in this room, that could be happening at this moment. And it's often experienced as conviction or kind of holding on to the chair in front of you saying, I don't want to go. And that rise of blood pressure that says, I know I should respond, but I don't want to. That, that expression there is a resistance like Paul had of kicking against the drawing of the Lord. But he says, it's the Father that's revealed this to you. It's a grace and mercy that the Father does. And in verse 18, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, which we know to mean, his name means little rock or pebble. But he says, then upon this rock I will build my church. And it's my belief that he's using language, a play on language, to talk about the little rock of Peter, but also the big, big rock of his confession. So it's upon the statement, because the church isn't built on the little rock of who Peter is, it's built on the big rock of his statement of confession about Christ. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the, king, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? It's the gospel. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in, in, uh, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes. Would everybody now read the last part of this verse, verse 21, out loud, ready? And be killed and be raised again the third day. Did Christ make this known to his disciples ahead of time? This isn't the first time that he testifies of the death that he's going to undergo. But as far as I could tell, this is the first time that he references his resurrection. And he tells them he's not only going to die, but he's going to rise again. And I want everybody to know here that this is God's plan of redemption. That God, the Father, would give of himself through the person of the Son, the eternal God, Jesus Christ, who puts on human flesh and he lives a sinless life because he's God. And he suffers on this planet, especially and in particular in relation to his public ministry. Christ is falsely accused, he's beaten, he's scourged, 
His blood flows. He has a crown of thorn, thorns beaten upon his brow. He's spat upon. He's mocked. He's ridiculed. And in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, and in John chapter 1, the very first part of the passage there, we read that Christ came unto his own and his own received him not. And the reason people didn't receive Christ is because their deeds were evil. And they loved the darkness more than the light because their deeds were evil. But Christ came anyway. And in those that would despise him, and in those that would abuse him, and in those that would deny him, he comes any way. And so he demonstrates his love to the world. He commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, in the midst of our sin, practicing our sin, Christ dies for us. It's my contention that when Christ was taken to the cross, and I don't want to confuse you, I don't want to tear your picture down of what the cross was. Um, Often the cross is displayed as what's exactly behind us. We're familiar with this picture where the hands are laid out upon the cross, and and this very much, very well, much be the way, may be the way in which the the cross was laid out. Others say that the cross was just a pole where hands would be uh, nailed above someone's head. Either way, Christ comes to the cross... And when Christ is having his hands and his feet nailed to the cross, I don't believe that the soldiers came and ripped his arm away from his body, stretched them out, and nailed I believe that Christ willingly laid his hands out for those who were even nailing him to the cross. He does it for them. But he does it for you. We don't make sense as human beings. We often can't see the plain truth that's right in front of us because we don't want to. You could argue over, well, why did God establish that free will would be part of the gospel? That you would have to decide to believe on Jesus. Why did God make it that way? You know, I can only suppose... But I'm going to suppose in front of you that God gave you a choice because he wants you to choose to come to him and choose to receive his grace and choose to receive his forgiveness out of the expression of love that he's given to you. But this is a decision that everyone must make. It is his plan. It is how God takes a sinner and makes them fit for heaven when they on their own would never be. Romans 1, 16 and 17 is a verse, or a couple of verses we often quote here, or say here, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, to everyone. For in the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So not only we come to Christ in faith, but we believe in heaven by faith. We believe in our redemption by faith. We believe in the hope that's in front of us by faith. And in this room, you either believe or you don't. But he offers for you to believe. Now, interesting, if we go back to Matthew 16, look at the next two verses. Our time's almost done. A little bit of hope there. Our time's almost done. Then Peter took him. Now, this is what Christ has just announced, and he just said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Christ says he's going to die, he's going to go to the cross. And I think that all that Peter hears is his death. He doesn't seem to hear his resurrection because he says, Peter took him and began to do what? He rebukes the gospel saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. What, Peter? That I'm going to die? Do you not hear the rest of the statement that I'm going to rise again? It seems to be lost on him. But listen to the adamacy of Christ's declaration 
of his will to go to the cross. He turns and says unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And this, folks, is the difference between those who come to Christ in salvation and those who are lost. Who are you going to listen to? God has given his evidence of his creating hand all around the world. The evidence of God is quite plain to see. Scientists, and, and they're out there, they're not hard to find. Scientists who still don't want to believe will still tell you that the Darwinian model is impossible. Did you hear me? Secular scientists will admit that. And all the while, you still have people saying, uh, and believing in evolution and, and denying God. So it may be the popular model, but it doesn't make it true. How do you know the gospel is true? Because of Jesus. Because of his resurrected life. I have a couple other passages to read. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to reference John 65. Excuse me, John 6. There is not a John 65, okay? Okay. In John 6, 35 through 40, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to give you the last verse, verse 40. It says, and this is the will of him, Jesus saying this. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And then he says this, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is the hope of the gospel. It's what we're celebrating today. So, we're not celebrating Easter bunnies as the Savior. If you have Easter bunnies that are chocolate, enjoy them. If you really have Easter bunnies that are not chocolate, I have some recipes and you can enjoy them too. <laughs> Bethany, if you're watching, forgive me, for I have sinned. If you have Easter egg hunts, and you put candy in them, and you enjoy uh, the fun of that, great, but we are not celebrating Easter eggs as what saves us. That's not what this is about. The truth is, there's a church at all because there's a resurrected Savior. And this church stands here as a light and testimony of the risen Christ. It's why... Though this is not an idol, it's a symbol. And the symbol has no figure of Christ on the cross because he's risen. Amen. He died once for the sins of all mankind. And we do well to remember the price of the cross and know that salvation is not easy. Salvation may be easy for you, but if you look at the complexity of the timing and will of God and prophecy and all that Jesus did to purchase your redemption, it is far, far, far from easy. But it's offered to you because Christ paid it all. There is coming a day where all who know Jesus will leave this world behind either by death or by resurrection, the coming of Christ. And he says, for all who believe, you are his children. And he's going to welcome you home to heaven. And I thank the Lord for the joy that's in front of me someday when I get to go to heaven. Somebody said this, and we are done. Somebody said this today because they knew I was sick again. And you knew who you are who said it. I'm trying to find you in here. <laughs> Wherever you are. You said, you probably should take your vitamins, Pastor Jeff. I just respond with this. I'll bet you there are no vitamins in heaven. <laughs> ain't no pills. Ain't no glasses. Ain't no canes. Ain't no aches or pains. 
Because God's going to give us a glorified body. Read 1 Corinthians 15 again. And we have hope. But lest I give you the idea that Christians are just living for the hope that's after this life, I just want to give a testimony and we're done. And to say, I would sure hate to live this life without Christ in my life. I would hate to think that the next pleasure is all I've got. That the next acquired thing is all there is. Because I don't care what it is. It's going to rust, dent, scratch, break. Because nothing in this world is eternal except for the soul that God's given you. And it's going to be somewhere forever. So with all that I know how to do as a preacher of the gospel, I entreat you and I beg you in Christ's stead, receive the gospel, place your faith in Christ, Know him as your savior and know the goodness of God who loves you before you loved him.